Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. Hello, I'm Lisa Joy Zagorski with the National Science Foundation. It's a pleasure to be here today with two dynamic professional women in science. Their accomplishments are impressive. Some could be called stellar, quite literally. In 1992, Dr. Mae Jemison blasted into orbit aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor to become the first woman of color to travel in space. Now, as founder and president of two technology companies, the space flight and her six years at NASA are just among her many achievements. She is here in Washington as the national spokesperson for Making Science Make Sense, a BEAR initiative that advances science literacy, a program for which the BEAR Corporation was honored by the National Science Board, the policy arm of the National Science Foundation. Dr. Kathy Olson is the deputy director of the National Science Foundation. Her career in science is illustrious as well. She served as chief scientist at NASA and worked in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. Kathy, May, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Making Science Makes Sense seeks to inspire the next generation of innovators and build a scientifically literate citizenry. How does this program work? I was really excited about Bear winning the, the award last night because it gives recognition that the National Science Board, which is the group that makes policy that understands what's important about science education and public service in science, they recognize this program that Bear has been putting together for over 14 years. The components of the program are, first of all, vo employee volunteerism. So employees take their time to go out to schools and help teachers. And this is primarily in kindergarten through sixth grade. Their other component of it is changing science curriculum, systemic uh, education reform. Because in order to teach science, in order to get it really across, you need to do it hands-on. I don't think any of us went into science because we got to memorize a periodic table. We went into it because it was about satisfying your curiosity about doing something, about learning more. And so in order to get children even more involved in science to maintain their interest and their curiosity, you used to need to do hands-on science education. And the other component of this program is public outreach, to help the public understand why is science education important, why is science literacy important, but not only help them understand, but give the parents tools to work with. So we put together uh, different kinds of programs that include books and pamphlets that parents can write off for, and then teach their children, actually not teach, work with their kids, to do the different kinds of science experiments. The public outreach has included surveys that every year have taken the pulse of some group and their ideas on science ranging from uh, corporate executives of fast growing technology companies to scientists themselves to teachers and also to government officials looking at what do we think is important about science education. So this program is, I've been very excited about. And just one other thing, when Bear is doing this, it's about science literacy. What we're talking about really isn't the next group of you know, scientists or Nobel laureates. It's really about how do you get everyone in the country to a baseline level of information so they can read that article in the newspaper and figure out how to vote on it. Because that's really what's making the difference in our world, what citizens want to have happen. And they need that understanding. So that's what the science literacy piece is about. Kathy, how does a successful program resonate with the goals and objectives of the National Science Foundation? Well, you know, the National Science Foundation was established in 1950, and uh, we support the basic research primarily at our colleges and universities and nonprofit museums um, in this country. We really advance the science that's the discoveries of the future. 
But we do that through the integration of research and education. And that's really one of our values. And in NSF's mission, we are also responsible for what we'd like to say K through gray, which is very consistent <laughs> with the goals of Bayer. But, but basically, we do the science research that really can be given to the teachers and to the public to like Bayer so they can be effective in terms of training the next generation. For our nation and actually for the world in the 21st century, we need to have innovators. We need to have creativity. And it really is um, the role and the mission of the National Science Foundation to actually train the next generations of mathematicians, engineers, and scientists, but just consistent with Bayer to ensure that all of our citizens have the science literacy, which is really critically uh, important uh, for now, for today, and for our future. Let me add on to that. I think, you know, when you talk about uh, training the next generation or creating the next generation of professional scientists, we actually need that pipeline, yes. right? So we can't say exactly who they're going to be, but we do know that in kindergarten and in first grade, kids love finding out stuff. They pick up the bugs, the snails, all those kind of things that are really important uh, in terms of discovery. And so what we really need to do is to make sure that all kids have the opportunity so that when they get to the point where they decide on what career they want to have, that we've had all our talent developed. We haven't uh, sort of stifled the group that we can find. So we have a much bigger talent pool that allows the NSF to continue to do its work. It allows us to continue to develop in terms of innovation. You, you make a really important point because um, the National Science Foundation also is responsible providing the, the indicators. So we provide the data that then can be used. And a couple years ago, um, they had some data um, in their report that indicated that, um, and I, I'll have to get the, the exact numbers, but in terms of people coming into, uh, as an undergraduate, wanting to major in science, math, and engineering, uh, it was about 35%. Uh, but after five years, only 15% of those have actually graduated. And we lose them because they're not prepared. And so the importance of K through 12 um, to enable um, their um, goals and their inspirations to become entrepreneurs and innovators and scientists uh, is really critical because you don't want to lose them when they already have the excitement as well and that's important for the training. Right. There, you know, there's one other piece you talked about uh, going into college and four-year colleges and coming out with a science or an engineering degree, a mathematics degree afterwards. But there's another part of the science literacy. The majority of jobs in the science, technology, engineering fields really don't require a four-year degree. We talk about researchers, we talk about the higher level technicians and stuff. That's where you get the four years degree, the master's degree, the PhDs, and the postdoc. But when you have the people who are actually working in the factories, when you have the electricians, those don't require a four-year degree. But they do require that you come out of high school able to do algebra trig, having a basic understanding of pH chemistry, those are the kind of things that are important. So it's really clear that we have to expect more of our students, that we have to expect more of ourselves and what we provide for them in terms of education. No, that's true. I actually um, had a young girl visiting me in my office, and um, she's kind of good in math, but she says, I don't want to pursue math. She says, what, what is math? And it's interesting because I started thinking about that. And you know, just the idea of how do you know how long it's going to take you to meet someone um, at the uh, store or the mall, okay? You know, what is the distance from that? What is the time that you go? That's algebra. Right. I mean, and that, and so all the stuff in terms of simple things in our everyday life, math is all around us. And when I started coming up with more and more examples, you know, I, I was sort of amazed myself <laughs> in terms of how much we actually use that knowledge that when you're actually doing, you know, x squared plus y equals z, you know, what does it actually mean? And it really is in everything that we do. Well, you were saying, you know, I want to go back again to uh, girls and, and women involved in the, the sciences and mathematics. You said this young woman was good in math, but she didn't necessarily know what she wanted to do with it. Um, a couple of years ago, I helped to put together a program called Celebrating Women of Color in Flight. So we had women from all around the world who were involved in aviation and aerospace. One of the women that we had uh, was a master sergeant and a master electrician aboard aircraft carriers. So she was a master uh, aviations person. She had a 
high school diploma. When she joined the military, she took her test, and they said, wow, you did really well in everything, particularly in the math and the sciences. What do you want to do? She said, well, I want to do whatever is going to allow me to get a really good job when I come out. <laughs> yeah. They said, be an electrician. And that's what yeah. she did. So when we look at you know, what does this mean, it means that you have the capacity to be involved in lots of different jobs, and particularly women have not been involved in as many of the sort of the trade jobs that are very high paying and also very fulfilling because we only look at things one way. It seems experience is really the underlying key here. Um, making science make sense, you serving as the national spokesperson is just one of the many hats you wear. I understand that perhaps you founded one of your own experiential programs um, years ago, an international science camp? Well, um, when I grew up, I had the benefit of a lot of people sort of, well, I don't know if a lot of people did it, but I had access to a lot of different programs that I would always avail myself to and I try to make programs and people always wanted to help me. But when I put together the Earth We Share, it's an international science camp for kids 12 to 16 years of age. I put it together because, again, I had the understanding that science literacy is going to be important. And I was also concerned about this whole idea that kids were asking, what does this have to do with me? Yeah. Right? So that's the math. What does this yeah. have to do with me? Well, it has lots to do with you. So I wanted to put together a curriculum that would answer that. I chose adolescence because that's a time when a lot of kids you know, fall yeah. out of science because that's when they, they're really asking, what does this have to do with me? So we chose adolescence. And we also chose to use as many different types of students as possible because you never solve a problem on your own. The students have to work in teams. And it's rare that you're going to just work with groups of people who are exactly like you, whether it's ethnicity, gender, uh, socioeconomics groups, geographic groups. And that's going to be even more so in the future. And so we had the students solve problems like predict the hot public stocks of the 2030, design the world's perfect house, how many people can the earth hold? The students come from all around the world. We had students from India, from Sierra Leone, from uh, Hong Kong, from Ireland, Sweden, Derby, Kansas, you know, yeah. <laughs> all kinds of places. And they work in teams over four weeks to solve problems. And those are the problems they work. And so we don't tell them the answer but we help them to think about things because problems usually come to you just like that. They don't come in the nice little packages. They usually come design the world's perfect house. Well, in order to do that, you have to bound the problem. Well, what do you mean by the world? What do you mean by perfect? What is a home? And for example, the teachers actually just guide the students through things. So when some of the answers that we got, because we've done world's perfect home a number of different summers. One summer students came up with, well, you know, we knew it could have had a lot of things, but we decided to go with a luxury home. You know? <laughs> yeah. So this is the one that had the in-home theater, yeah. it had all the kind of stuff. Another year, a group said, we wanted to build a home that could be put up in almost any country and that would be affordable. So they developed sort of a prefab house that was circular, so they would, it wouldn't be any issue with direction, with prayer and things like that. And another year, the students decided that they wanted to have sort of a, a zero footprint house that was very energy efficient because in the long run, the world needs homes that are going to be sufficient on themselves that don't pull a lot out. What do the students get from that? Well, each group had to explore environmental issues. They had to explore technology issues, but they had to make a decision. And it was their ability to make that decision and then go out and present their solutions that kept them engaged. And so we didn't have to tell them you have to work on this because they didn't want to let their buddies down. You know, that adolescent time is where you have this enormous creativity, motivation. And so what we do is to get the students to use their powers for good, not evil, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we also train teachers because, to me, the most important thing we can do is to get teachers um, comfortable with not necessarily knowing the answer, but being able to be the guides because the answers are going to change and you don't have to have all the information but you can help guide your students through a thought process and that critical thinking, which is really sort of the hallmark, I think, of science and science education. Actually, um, I go to you know, grade schools and I go to uh, universities and that, and one of the messages that I like to get across is the fact that um, careers in science really opens up, uh, I mean career, uh, majoring in science opens up a, a wide uh, maze of careers. Uh -huh. And the reason is because Science makes you think. It's very hypothesis driven. Uh, you become very flexible. You have to have the teamwork. And that kind of training is really critically important for almost everything that you do. And now, I mean, and the NSF is very big on this too, science and engineering is global. And we have to think global as well. 
Well, that was what was the neat thing about having those students work together because, you know, when we had students from, you know, Sierra Leone, which have, yeah. and they were starting to input on the World's Perfect House, they had a completely different idea mm -hmm. because they said, oh, we want to have materials that we can get in our location, right? Yeah. We, we want to be able to um, make different people afford this. So I mean, it really starts to change the equation. And the reason why we do international with teenagers because it's a wonderful time for them to get to know each other. Yeah. They have enough sense of self that they can provide other people with an idea of what their society is like. But at the same time, they're open and they have a thirst for knowledge. So it's not going to be uh, as difficult for them to, to see themselves and others at that time. So that's, you know, one of the And again, I, I keep that. going back to the National Science Foundation, but the National Science Foundation now has programs to get undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs with the international experience. Because again, you start young, it becomes part of um, the way that you really carry out um, your um, career, uh, the way that you look at things, and you need to have that exposure of how other people, other cultures think and do business. And I, I think it's going to be um, critical uh, really for our world. When you were starting in your careers, there weren't such programs. When did you experience the aha moment, the eureka moment that made you decide to pursue science? I wanted to go back and, and tell you that, you know, there have almost always been programs for people who had already excelled or done well yeah. in the sciences. You could almost always find some place to get a scholarship. You know, that's after you had gotten into high school and you had done well, but you almost did well on your own. You almost did it in spite of, especially as, as a woman in the sciences back then, I guess. Yeah. Or what you almost did it on your own. And so, um, you know, it's the reason why the program that Bear does, the reason why the work that NSF is doing in terms of looking at important curricula that, you know, in the past have been the urban systemic initiatives and other things that prove that this is a way you can help students learn. The reason why those are so important is because they push back and try to make sure we develop all of our talent again. And I just have to say that because it, it, is, a very, it is a very different perspective than when I was growing up. And so, you know, I did have help. I had... Uh, I went to the Junior Engineering Technical Society program in Champaign-Urbana, but that's again for students who are in their junior year yeah. of high school, which means you've already done the algebra trig. You already have been, you know, people think that you're good mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to be a scientist or an engineer. Um, I had help one time, I remember calling up um, Hectowin uh, Laboratories, it was the Cook County Hospital Hematology mm -hmm. Lab. And I said I wanted to do a project on sickle cell anemia. Now I was a little brazen, a little bold, you know. but the <laughs> The head of department that has helped not me. Hurt you it in has your not life. That's right. <laughs> but the head of department yeah. helped me. But that was already because I sort of knew what to do and already had the impetus to do that. So it, it makes a difference. In terms of my aha moment, I don't ever think I had, you know, a singular aha moment that I wanted to go into sciences. Whenever I was, I remember from a little girl saying I wanted to be a scientist. But I had an aha moment when I decided which field I would major in. Now in college, I also majored in African studies. Um, and so I did both degrees, but I decided on chemical engineering, I really wanted to be a physicist. <laughs> I started off and in, in, I wanted to be a physicist and astronomer, but at some point, I remember a friend of mine, or a friend of a friend of mine was killed in a car accident driving up to Stanford. It was one of those times where you really start to think about things, because you know, 19 years old and you don't think things like that can happen. And at some point I thought, well, I don't know whether or not I should, you know, I could do the physics and the astronomy, not because I wasn't capable of doing it, because, you know, physics was one of my best subjects, but because I thought maybe it didn't, it didn't have as much application. Yeah. And the engineering, I maybe could do the application work and that, you know, I could have, save some of the other stuff for later on and for other people. So that was a, a period of time. I don't know if it was an aha, but I remember writing things to myself because I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what were the reasons for doing that. I was a sophomore, so I guess I was 18, and I was writing all those things down. You know, the interesting part about it is, so I still got to go into space. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you can sort of circle that's back right. around, and it has more to do with intention. I just wanted to explore. That's what I knew. I knew I wanted to explore. I knew I wanted to sometimes teach, and it was more of an intention. It wasn't a career. I know people ask me, did you always want to be an astronaut? And I said, no, I want to go into space. And they think yeah. I'm playing semantics. I'm really not. 
you know, I would go into space any kind of way. At the time I was growing up during Apollo, I thought we'd just be going to space. That's right. You know, yes, just yes. as as part of like, you know, scientists were concerned, yeah. right, right. To, to, right, to study. So I wanted to go into space. You know, I would have stu stood in a Nebraska cornfield with aluminum foil in my head if I thought E.T. would pick me up. But, you know, <laughs> that, I had a much better chance of flying to the astronaut. <laughs> I shouldn't have said no, that. But it's, <laughs> no, but, but, it's, but you know, it's interesting because it very contrasts my career. And I think, you know, you're talking about, you know, your mentors and that you had teachers and you could call up and help. Actually, I did not like science uh, in high school. And um, I don't even remember ever taking science in grade school. Even in the inquiry-based um, kind of learning, I remember science fair uh, in sixth grade. But it was interesting because I was in sort of accelerated groups and uh -huh. sort of picked out like what you were. Um, there were actually only one other person, one other woman in my science class who uh, went on to get a degree in physics and uh, computer science. But when I graduated from high school, the only thing I knew I wasn't going to be was a scientist. And it was interesting because the importance of the teacher and the inspiring. And what happened in college is um, I had to kind of fit in biology. Uh, you know, because of just how right. the things did it. The professor was fantastic, and I realized I loved it for the same way with you. I read mystery novels all the time. I love to explore. I love to try to figure out what the parts are and then what the conclusion is and how my hypothesis can change with the new data right. coming in. I found it was very, very easy, but I would have actually been lost because of the importance, and that's why Bayer and the National Science Foundation really does a good role because it's really the teachers really impact our lives especially through K through 12. And, mm -hmm. and, and now for me, uh, through college and that. And the other thing was interesting, and it's one of those things when I talk to a lot of people, I actually didn't know that there were a lot of careers out there in the science degree. I knew, you know, my, mm -hmm. I, my aha moment is I was gonna get my PhD and I was going to um, become a faculty member and I was gonna do research at a university. And I was mm -hmm. gonna carry out uh, funded research. And I did that, you know, I got my PhD in four years, I did a postdoc for a year, I got my first assistant professor job, I got my NIH grants um, uh, to carry out my research. And I thought, is this it? <laughs> and no, but it, but it was interesting yeah. because I realized with my personality what I want, there was, but then I realized that that science degree trade me for so many other things. Mm -hmm. And that's what young people, because they think that this is the one way of going, and there's so many career options. I mean, and that's why, you know, as I say, I use you in one of my slides, but it just shows what you can actually do with the proper training in um, science and engineering. I think one of the things that I always talk with students about is you do have to have some depth. Yes. You know, sometimes oh, yeah, you people do. sort of, you know, I, I, I've sort of done a, a number of different things, but you do have to have some depth. So you have to have that depth yeah. in, in engineering. You have to have that depth in medicine where you have, you, you know enough that you've been able to get into the, some of the pitfalls That's of right. things and, and pick yourself back up and you've had to have gone through things, not where it was just on the easy level where you had to sort of delve down and, and get much deeper. But once you do that, it prepares you for so many That's other right. things. It does. It prepares you for so much. It's sort of funny for me. Um, the other thing I did, I loved doing it. My big dilemma was going into dancing. I love dancing. Uh -huh. I love dancing, and I, and I wanted to be a professional dancer. Uh -huh. and, um, I, did I, I did. I wanted to be a professional dancer. I'm, I'm when, I was, <laughs> when I was at when I was at uh, Stanford, like my senior year, saw me with uh -huh. a dilemma. You know, do I do you know I do do I go to New York City to try to become a professional dancer, or do I go to medical uh -huh. school? And my mother helped me solve that. <laughs> and you know, and, and I chose, I ch yeah. <laughs> but I chose, I still, when I went to medical school, this is again, I was in New York City, on Manhattan, uh -huh. and I took dance classes at Alvin Ailey, yeah. you know, so I mean, those are things you can always do. The reason why I brought that up is because sometimes you think that things can't be applied. That's right. But one of the things that I found very helpful, and I didn't think about it until a little girl asked me, you know, how did dance help you in being an astronaut, and all the little kids laughed at her, and I thought about, well, you know, all those simulation sessions is practice, right? And dancers can be really cruel to one another. So you have to take yeah. critique really well because there are a lot. Yeah. So you have to be able to take critique. So I and reviews <laughs> back on a grant, yes. <laughs> That's right. You, 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 um, the memory is yeah. there because you can't take notes out onto That's the right. dance floor with you, right? So there's the memory. There's all the training. There's And just the stick to it of this because it required lots and lots and lots of practice and you know, sometimes things come easily, sometimes they don't. And, you know, so there are all these pieces that always work back around. And I think folks should always recognize that, you know, they can be useful. You don't, 
hardly anything you do in life is really a throwaway. You know, I, that, that's really interesting. I, I love sports. And um, we were fortunate at the National Science Foundation to have Arthur Ashe uh, talk to Binnaker um, High School for one of the science and technology uh -huh. weeks that Bayer actually sponsored. And what he was talking about was science and sports. You know, and just even how you throw a baseball and the physics of that, of the curveball and all that kind of stuff. And I always like to tie those things together um, as well. And the uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, which is uh, University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, has their big uh, uh, instruments. And they're named after sports figures in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, the, the last one is named after the quarterback. Uh, and it's called Big Ben. But you know, you still sit there and you think about what that computer can do, but what the human can actually do, right. which is so much quicker and faster and uh, um, um, way. But I like that because I think that's important in terms of um, for scientists and engineers really to have be well rounded. Because again, you get these stereotype images mm -hmm. of us uh -huh. that we are, you know, just focused in our laboratory or whatever, and it's not. No, I mean, we not at all. No. It seems that popular culture does an awful lot to both make and break stereotypes. Nay, I must bring this up, that you did a stint on a TV show, <laughs> Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> Let's talk about what TV, film, portrayals of science and scientists, how it's shaping our attitudes, hope for the future. Well, I, I think it has shaped our attitudes, and, um, and, and, and in two ways. I think as Kathy was talking about, there's this whole thing about you know, there's very narrowly focused folks who don't see anything else, who are not feeling, who are not humanistic at all. And that's wrong. One of my, the people that I really, really admired was Linus Pauling, who oh, won a Nobel wanted, Prize yes. for his work in biochemistry, mm -hmm. um, considered the father of modern day of biochemistry in terms of protein structure and all of that. But he also won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work to stop above ground nuclear testing which is one of those things that speaks to really caring about what happens in the world. And I think that's really one of the big issues that scientists have to get to, is, is making sure that we're involved. But going on with images, I think one of the images, I mean, we were growing up, if there was a woman scientist in something, there was always like super nerd in a certain extent. But in, in just, just guys in general, even, even men, uh, that happened. Uh, the other, and, and we need to change that. The reason why I did the, the, the episode of Star Trek is because I watched Star Trek as a little kid, okay? I, I was an original Star Trek series fan. The reason it was so great is because good science fiction allows you to take social issues and cultural issues of a society and look at them through a different lens because you have different technologies, different peoples, different physical, physiological circumstances from which to view them. And Star Trek was one of those fantasies that said, okay, right in the middle of the Cold War, we were able to get beyond that. You know, we didn't, we didn't blow up the world entirely. Right? And it also had for the first time people from all different uh, uh, races together. We even had a Vulcan on the, on, the, on the starship. So it says we were able to start to deal with those, those kinds of issues. And on top of that, we had uh, the first time we had a woman in a, in a technical role that was ongoing and who wasn't a nerd, right? <laughs> Nobody, I don't think anybody aboard the Starship Enterprise was really a nerd, right? No, no, Not no. in that first crew. They were very uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that those, those changed the images. And what we have to do, again, is to work on that popular culture, CSI. So how many people are now wanting to go into CSI careers, even though they do, you know, I think people who investigate crime scenes actually turn on the lights and, you know, and they, and they probably don't wear tank tops and all those kind of things. But it's because you've had an opportunity to view those things and it's viewed as a light that this is very interesting, then people start to gravitate toward those fields. So that's the reason it's really important to start to change the image. I did Star Trek because, um, First of all, it's really fun. It comes back around full circle. The, the possibilities, you know, are there, you know, and, and it also says that, you know, again, you don't just have to choose one thing. There are all kinds of possibilities. And if I can be light and make fun of, not, it's not even making fun of myself. It's really sort of saying that there are other things and it's okay to imagine. You know, it's not about being dull and just sitting in one place. We're actually imagining into the future. Mm -hmm. Talk about imagination. Today, many will point to the incredible power that Sputnik had way back when. 
in terms of inspiring America to pay more attention to science and its scientific enterprise and to invest in scientific infrastructure. Do we have a Sputnik-like source of inspiration today? You see, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really concerned that we always have to have a crisis in order to do the right thing. But if we need a Sputnik type of inspiration, it, energy, natural resources, pollution of the oceans, all of those things should be enough for us to say, whoa, we need to make some changes and we need to take advantage of our, of our, you know, our knowledge base to do something better. So if we need a crisis, I would say those are there. But it doesn't mean that we do things just in short term to look at, um, doesn't mean with an energy crisis that we go drilling everywhere. It means that we should have looked back into the 19, late 1960s and 70s where we had an energy crisis and we started to look at different kinds of alternative energy, energies and fuels to understand that we should make investments for the long term, not just for what is popular right now. We need to make investments for the long term. Um, our infrastructure in the sciences have been uh, depleted. You know, one of the things that uh, we were talking about before we got on was that the majority of teachers are trained in small colleges and universities. They have not a wealth of a laboratory equipment or research equipment, yet these are the people who are going to be training our students from that critical time, K through 12, and they're not introduced to science or research or have the ability to be involved with any of the kind of equipment that is going to be needed. So yes, we need to start to change that infrastructure because just like uh, sort of our highway infrastructure has not been refurbished, a lot of our laboratory and our school infrastructure has not been refurbished over the years. I think we need to do something about that. These days it's also a problem because very often, and I think um, Kathy can speak to this more, very often we don't give grants, we don't provide funding for infrastructure, for for universities, for schools, and especially if they're not large research projects. And we've got to figure out how do we change that because the schools and universities do require those things. I don't know if you could... Actually, the National Science Foundation did have a program about uh, 10 years ago. And it, as it was actually very interesting because every state received uh, support over the three years of the program to renovate one of the uh, laboratories uh, in their college or university. And it was interesting in, in terms of the program because you had sort of three sort of groups that competed so that you would have your MITs and Caltechs competing among each other and then you would have sort of schools that did not get that much support from the National Science Foundation competing and then you had institutions that I have to admit even I uh, and I thought I could go on Jeopardy and uh -huh. name the the school in which state and everything uh -huh. but there'd be very small two and four year colleges. And it, the money was really distributed um, uh, across uh, the U.S., across the types of institutions. And it, it was a, um, a, a good program. We also support instrumentation and we support um, um, research for instrumentation uh, of classrooms. And then a lot of research came out of that program in terms of how do you design research laboratories that really maximize the creativity, the innovation. And so it's a really um, quite a successful uh, program. So, but the question I would ask you is how many schools were able to reach? And oh, then not what that happened? Many. No. And then what happened to the program? Because yeah. we can reach it if, you know, That's for a three year program, and I don't think the NSF's budget sort of ballooned by three or four hundred percent during yeah. that time period, right? There you could reach a few schools, but we're talking about all the schools. And so, how do we get um, the federal government and state governments, really society, to commit to improving education. You know, we pay a lot of lip service to education these days, whether we talk about uh, mathematics, numeracy, reading literacy, science literacy, geography, whatever. But I don't think as a society we've really uh, put our energy and our resources behind it. I mean, we, we talk about funding schools through lotteries. I mean, what kind of message is that? We would never, ever, no. we haven't talked about doing health care through lottery yet, have we? No. No. And, and but, I, but you know, it, it's interesting, because did you ever go to the Goddard dinner uh, mm. when you were at NASA? No. They have the Goddard dinner. We call it space prom. And uh, this year, Neil Armstrong spoke, and it was just wonderful, in, inspirational. The year before that, it was John Glenn. 
And John Glenn made a statement that really impacted me because of my integration of research and, and um, education and my goals in my life. But he, he started talking and he says, why is America great? You know, we were established in 1776 and what made us a world leader? What made us in terms of our, our standard of living is so high? And he said it was investment on education and the investment for research. So we're always the next step in terms of innovation. And that really took home to me because you're talking about the Yaha moment and Sputnik and that, and you're talking about we really shouldn't have like a crisis that really forces us to do something. But to me, that message in terms of education and research, that's really for the betterment of all. Mm -hmm. And that should be kind of our Sputnik in, in, in a sense. I mean, that shouldn't be, that should be why we are doing that because it's our well-being, it's our health, it's our, our just our intellectual discovery, you know, in terms of how do we get here, where are we going, are we alone, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. And that really did because I think we missed the fact, and, and you just brought that up, it's really education and then, uh, again, the investments in the research, the research infrastructure that will enable that. And I think that's critical for America and the world's prosperity. Mm -hmm. Now, what priorities would you like for our both elected leaders and those seeking elective office, what would you like them to focus on and articulate? I think that the issue we have is science literacy even within our leadership. Why do I say that? It's because when I look around from sitting on boards of directors, from sitting, uh, being on advisory boards, from going to different you know, uh, conferences, so often people talk, start talking about innovation. right? And they think that they can say, innovate something and it's going to happen. So there's not this real understanding that, that uh, science and technology advancements take time, that you can't just automatically you know, turn on a, on a, uh, a spigot and it happens. I mean, I remember with the NASA, we talk about, is this a problem that can be solved by throwing money and people at it? Some things cannot be solved by throwing money and people, which means that you have to continue that level of research that's just because we want to know. Very often these days, we're demanding that uh, technology development uh, or, or research grants have a commercial application associated with them. You know, what are you going to get from this? How are you going to make, uh, monetize this? Well, we need to have that continuous level of research because a lot of the things that we're monetizing a day, quote unquote, whether it's you know um, genetic engineering or any of those, they're really predicated on things that happened, research that was done in the in the early '60s. You know, that's that's the reason we're here now because we actually were doing that basic research. I just need to know, and now we figured out what we have, uh, how we can use it. So. You know, this whole idea that uh, we can solve the problem right away in science and technology, will come up with a solution immediately for it, is a little bit um, misguided. But if people knew sort of the timeline and felt comfortable with it, not that they're solving the equations, none of that, but they felt the timeline, then I think we would see people talking about it more, investing it more. We wouldn't have done things, again, like cut off um, alternative energy research and then expect that we can just turn it back on now. I, I have to <laughs> laugh because you know NSF obviously supports where discoveries right. begin. So this is what our, our mission is. But Rocky Cope, Dr. Rocky Cope, um, who's at Fermi Lab and the University of Chicago, recently gave a talk at the Carnegie Institute. And he had a slide. And it was basically looking at cell phones and um, um, HTTV, you know, all the, the next generation technology. And um, he says it's basic, he's a physicist, and he says, thank you physics and quantum physics because it was really fundamental research that really led to all the um, wonderful toys in Best Buy and Circuit City. And I, you know, really people don't think about that sort of real fundamental research that plays a role. Um, one and, of, and, yeah. that, and that research happened in the, in, for that, for the late 50s, yeah. right? So one of the things that we do is at NSF is because you can't predict. Okay, right. and we don't want to predict, but what we do is we, we look back. And so we look back at our investments that we don't know if there was going to be a payoff in that, right. but because it, it's really purely uh, discovery science. And then, you know, we actually look back and go, whoa, Google. Oh, that was on an NSF grant. Barcodes. I love those barcodes. Um, but those are really fundamental research. Do you know when I first heard of barcodes? Uh huh. 
And this is the, it was actually when I was in a junior engineering technical society program, which is in 1976, if I could, no, 1971 or uh -huh. 72. So, but they didn't come into, you know, continuous usage until the mid 80s, right? Or the late later, 80s, yeah. late 80s. But that, that sort of that, some, a lot of that work had been done, obviously, in the late 60s. So it takes a while for these things to come online, which means that we have to have that continuous level of development, of research going on in order to get where we need to go. I think one of the biggest problems we have right now is when people take short-term views and want to put Band-Aids on things. And again, that issue comes up with whether when we're talking about you know, the environment and global warming or whatever. These are things that require long-term solutions it means that we have to pay attention to what we want the world to be like in the years to come. So often I think our generation has been, um, I think we can indict ourselves for having thought only of ourselves and our comfort and not looking into the future. You know, and we, we say these things, we say, well, we know we're trying to make our grandchildren pay for it. And we say it sort of tongue in cheek, and then we don't do anything about it. And so we have to stop and think, that let's not do short-term solutions. So the, what science, what priorities that I would make? I would say give more funding without it being particularly earmarked for a specific result. Let, let Kathy help us to decide <laughs> how we spend the money. I mean, there are people and there are scientists and there are folks out there who have had a lifetime of experience sort of understanding the research and development and how technology is designed have them involved. And then the other piece I'd say, make sure that we talk about social responsibility. You know, it's one of the things that I think science literacy is very important for is so that people, everyday folks, become comfortable reading an article in the newspaper and figuring out how to vote on something. Every day, our society is impacted by scientific developments and discoveries. What do we use them for? You know, we have an opportunity to decide whether we use our nuclear physics understanding for nuclear bombs, nuclear power plants, nuclear medicine. I mean, it's not preordained. We have an opportunity to do that. And every day, our society, by how we vote for research funding, how we vote for whether money goes to defense for uh, space flight or further goes to NASA for space flight, those are decisions that society makes that pushes our scientific and technological development in one way or another. And, and that's what we have to pay attention to. What is social, what is our societal responsibility? The scientists don't just get to decide, even though we have to be more involved, I think. But they have to, they go for funding in those areas where funding is available. And society pushes or controls the, the funding and the scientific research into one area or another. Both of you obviously love your job, and that enthusiasm is contagious. I'm hoping that as young women and young people around this country watch the show, they too will be inspired. Tell us about the most challenging aspects of your work and what you're most proud of. Actually, that's a very difficult question. Um, one of the reasons that I chose government service is the fact that you can um, basically develop programs and activities that can have a major impact on our society. You know, you mentioned earlier about going into engineering uh, versus physics about uh, the fact that you saw this as a way to sort of improve. And, you know, there, uh, my research, is, as you know, was in sex differences in the brain. And there's more individual differences than there are gender differences. But in general, um, a lot of the studies have reported that women like to go into professions, okay, where they feel that they can do service, where they can do in terms of common good. And that's why I'm always shocked when there are not more women in engineering because engineering is so critical uh, mm -hmm. for that component. Um, so one of the things that I'm most proud about are things that where you, you can't say it's not an individual, it was me. It was just that I was in the room and discuss, discussing in terms of how do we get more support for uh, research in this country, uh, for education in this country, to really be able to provide strategic ways uh, that Congress then appropriates the funds that then through merit review we can get out. So in many ways, my proud moments is what we enable 
the scientists and engineers and teachers, okay, to do. And I know that sounds sort of strange because it's not about, well, I did this or I did that, but it was really, that's why I really enjoy and I really love uh, service in the, the federal government because it really does enable that. Uh, and you look at, you know, from every publication to um, a better prediction for weather, and you know that support from the National Science Foundation provided that. So that's where I really am, am incredibly um, a proud. And it's the same thing when I worked at NASA, you know, as well. Uh, you know, you, you see, like Cassini. I mean, Cassini is just amazing to me. I mean, in terms of the technology and how old the technology was, that it's swimming through the rings of Saturn and collecting data. When you look at Mars um, in terms of opportunity and spirit, and I was actually in the room when we made the decision to go with two, and I actually was the person that volunteered the first little bit of extra money that they needed um, to do that. So again, the world doesn't know that, but I know that I was part of that goal and again, so was everybody else, and it was taxpayers' money. And it, and it, but it's just those are the kind of rewards mm -hmm. that I just think is, is just very, very important. And government service enables that. I want to go on a similar point. When you ask about challenging and proud and difficult moments, actually, they're all in the same for me. Because I think the most challenging thing that I've had is to be able to use whatever position I had at the table what to bring my experience base and background to bear. Sometimes those ideas that I might bring to bear were not necessarily going to be popular, or maybe they may not going to be ideas that people um, wanted to hear at that time, right? I've but, been there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the challenge, and that's the rewarding part, is to be able to present a different set of ideas. So, you know, when people said, oh, it's really great, you're the first African-American woman astronaut, what difference would it have made, right? If I had not brought to bear the work that I had done in developing countries before, even my background as a physician to the astronaut program, having grown up in Chicago public schools, if I did not bring those things to bear on some of the positions, the questions, the solutions, and then after leaving the astronaut program, you know, I learned a lot about remote sensing. I learned a lot about, um, you know, about uh, satellite and telecommunications and planetology and geography. If I didn't bring those to bear on some of the work that I did afterwards, what difference would it make? And so it's really being able to bring those positions, I mean, bring those ideas to the, you know, where you are at the table. That's the challenge, that's the opportunity, that's the reward, and that sometimes have been, you know, some of the darkest moments because... Um, you knew you had to say something that uh, folks aren't going to be that excited about. But you have to say it and you have to do it and you have to stick by your guns. We've talked about the importance of capturing the imagination of young people so that they'll embrace a career in science and engineering and just become an, um, educated in general in critical thinking. I'd like to capture the education of two incredible professionals with your lifetime of experience. And I'd love for you to tell, tell us about what you think the future holds for science engineering. If you had your druthers, what's your wish list? Well, I actually think that, again, you need to have knowledge on math, science, and engineering. And that knowledge is going to be critical for the 21st century. And uh, again, in careers in science, it's, it's just it's learning the science. You know, it's interesting. As deputy director of the National Science Foundation, my actual job title is not listed um, and not um, recorded as a science job. Obviously, you need the science in the background. And one of the things, again, talking to the, um, the students, I go in and people go to law school, not because um, they're going to be a practicing lawyer, okay, but because it really opens up incredible opportunities for them with that degree and that way of thinking. I would like, in terms of the future, that people pursue science and engineering, okay, and that because of the same um, way of going to law school, because it opens up just incredible uh, career opportunities. And that's why I use May as an example in terms of when I'm talking, because here's a person majored in engineering, okay, um, became uh, a doctor, taught at the university, started companies, 
works internationally in terms of capacity building, you know, all that kind of stuff. And to me, that's what I want to inspire the young people to know is that w with this knowledge in math and science and engineering, it just opens up so many opportunities uh, for you in your life. If I were going to talk about imagination, I, I want to first of all say that you know, the wonderful thing about being involved with the sciences, you don't have to try to help you, young people create their imagination or anything. You capture their imagination because it's already there and you give them something to think about and then they, they move forward. So it's actually wonderfully easy to do. The hard part is when you want to s squash their imagination out of them and you sort of beat it out of them and you want them to only do one thing. That's, that's a part that, well, actually, we're pretty good at that right now. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I just want to make sure that we understand that imagination is there and people think about things. We have to allow them the freedom to do it. When I think about the future and I would imagine the future that I want in science and technology, it would start off by people understanding that the word innovation just means new. It doesn't necessarily mean good, it doesn't necessarily mean beneficial, it doesn't necessarily mean progress. So when we have uh, companies and folks asking for innovation, I'm always amused when you hear people talk about innovate on a particular product, and it's, it's not a big, really big difference, you know, <laughs> you know, whether we have a mop that does it this way or that way. I do like the mop. pink cell phones, though. <laughs> <laughs> right, and the pink cell phones, it's a color, it's, you know, yeah, but we, have, right. we use this term innovation yeah. as though it's something that automatically means better. And so when, if I had my druthers, I'd like for us to understand that we can also look at things through the prism of not just that it's new, but that it has some beneficial impact on society. So if we were to start to talk about innovate, uh, actually what would be wonderful is if we could use some of our knowledge base, some of our research, to really and truly figure out how all humans and all species and everyone else could share in the wealth of this planet. And I'm not doing that from a, you know, save the world kind of thing. But if we talk about clean water, that means we have to talk about sharing resources. Really, what do we use them for? Well, not just how much you use, but what in the world do we use them for? How much, how much energy does it take to produce clean water versus to overcool homes in the summertime so that you have to put coats on, right? We, we have to really talk about that, and that would be the challenge. Not to just say, oh, why are you guys going into space? We have problems down here on Earth. But every day, space exploration has helped us to solve problems down here on Earth. Remote sensing. Yes, remote sensing maps are very expensive, but they're much less expensive than doing a survey on the ground where you're looking at the typology of the ground and trying to figure out where mineral resources are. The communications. You know, where telecommunications is completely different because of space. You know, our, our ability to look at information systems, whether you look at the human body as an information, a set of information and data, or whether you're looking at terrain, you know, and geographical information systems. All those are the kinds of things that tell us to use our imagination beyond just what people have told us is the norm, to really start to break down and understand how we're using our resources having a vision of the future that I hope includes a healthy world that everyone has an opportunity to, to live their life where they're as free from disease as they can be. They have an opportunity to smile and laugh and they have an opportunity to feel like it made a difference that they were here. And you can't forget Velcro. <laughs> Velcro was critical. The theme is breaking boundaries in all ways, shapes, and forms, and you two both certainly have. I think you've been an inspiration to those watching. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes.